Hi, I'm Tony, and this is Long Story Short. I've got something very important to share with you all today. We've found half of the missing matter in the universe. Great news, right? Of course, it's not as if it's missing in the sense that your keys go missing when you misplace them. We didn't lose all of this matter per se. We had predicted that it was out there with mathematical models of the universe. We've predicted that there is a ton of matter and energy out there, actually, and that the overwhelming majority of it consists of stuff we currently can't see, touch, or, well, interact with in any meaningful way. Dark matter and dark energy. Maybe we'll talk about it sometime in the future. But out of the tiny remaining portion of more familiar matter and energy that we do expect to see, well, everything we had found by looking out at the sky only accounted for something like a tenth of it. We knew there was more regular matter and energy out there, but despite our best efforts, we just weren't finding most of it. Until now. Two independent teams, one in France and another in the United Kingdom, have just discovered evidence of approximately half of that missing matter. Theories like this existed in the past, but we now have proof that it exists in the form of huge tendrils of very, very thin gas which stretch through the vacuum between galaxies. Vast, indescribably long stretches of this gas fuel the denser galaxies that make up our night sky with their matter and energy. Seeing as this all accounts for way more of the universe's mass than all our galaxies and stars and the like combined, it seems we're living in a very young universe with a lot of fuel still left. Anyway, that's all well and good, but you might be asking yourself right now, why should I care what's between the galaxies out there? That stuff is so far away from me, it couldn't possibly matter. And in a sense, you're absolutely right. The structures described by these two research teams are so far away from Earth, I doubt anyone's ever going to travel there. However, this discovery does help us in proving the standard model of the universe. The standard model of the universe encompasses all scientific theories and laws that we have detected and deduced thus far. It describes an accurate and to our best scientific degrees of certainty factual representation of the universe at all orders of organization. It's reality. It's the stuff we're made of, the rules and structure that govern everything. I want to talk to you about the complexity of the universe here on Long Story Short. Before we get into the meat and potatoes of the taxonomy of reality, I have to offer a short disclaimer. We're going to be discussing the building blocks of the universe throughout this video at various degrees of complexity, mass, and size. This is not a simple topic, because the universe is not a simple place. To streamline this train of thought, I've omitted discussions about cosmological anomalies such as black holes, quasars, supernova, and other interesting entities. If I were to discuss these now, it would quickly throw me off course. You'll definitely be hearing about all that stuff in later videos, though. It's all very interesting. It's also important that you keep in mind the scale of what we're discussing. This stuff gets so big and so small that it can be really, really difficult to comprehend. But for now, I'm going to throw some definitions at you so that we have somewhere to start. The meter is officially defined as the distance light travels in 1,299,792,458 of a second. A light year is the distance light travels then in a year. This can be worked out from our definition of a meter, and it's really, really far. 9.45 times 10 to the 15th meters, to be exact. For reference, and this is a really rough estimate, our current spacefaring technology would probably take around 20,000 years to cover that distance. Also, a parsec is another cosmic scale unit of distance equal to 3.26 light years. In any case, the scale of the universe is massive. For reference, the nearest star to our own is just over four light years away. If you're having trouble visualizing these scales or just want to look at an awesome educational tool, go to scaleofuniverse.com to view a fantastic interactive visual guide by Carrie and Michael Huang. 
It's very informative and expresses the size of things in the universe on a logarithmic scale, which is the only meaningful way to express the drastic changes in size. With all that in mind, let's begin. There are two basic parts to the universe. The first part is the given region of three-dimensional space that the universe actually occupies. One huge question regarding this volume asks if it stretches on for an infinite distance. Is the universe really infinite, or simply finite but massive beyond comprehension? We must work with what we know to figure this out. The observable universe is everything within 4.4 times 10 to the 26th meters of Earth. This maximum is determined by the age of the universe and the speed of light in a vacuum. Due to these two constraints, there could possibly exist regions of space that we cannot physically see because the light just hasn't had time to reach us yet. We cannot make any comments about the universe outside of our observable section of it. If there is any universe past what we can see, we don't know anything about it. Because we only have information on a subset of the universe and not all of reality, there are a lot of things we don't know about the universe as a whole. From a topological perspective, and with minimal exceptions, three-dimensional space behaves normally as we experience it here for the entire observable universe. Astronomers have searched everywhere for duplicate cosmological structures and arrangements looking for deviations from this behavior. Thus far, they have failed to identify any repetitions in space. This suggests that there is no visible wraparound effect. This is a big deal, because it's something that would present itself if the subset of the universe that we can observe was deformed into a discrete, continuous topological entity. Think of like a donut shape. In this structure, we could travel through space in one direction and reach your starting point by following the contour of the volume without turning around. Basically, if the whole universe is shaped like a big donut or some strange indeterminate geometric shape, or simply has no bounds and continues forever, we can't tell yet, because we can't see enough of it. So let's keep working with what we know. The minimum volume of the universe, assuming there is no universe outside what we can observe, and again, we don't know, is estimated at 4.22 times 10 to the 32nd cubic light years. This is an unfathomable volume. To meaningfully discuss the properties of this region of space and those of the matter within the volume, this is the second part of the universe I was referring to earlier, we must invoke the cosmological principle. This states that, at a great enough scale, the universe must appear homogeneous and isotropic. Basically, it looks generally uniform, no matter what the orientation is. If we assume the universe, when viewed as a whole, appears to be uniform, then we must go down a level of complexity to begin our investigation, where certain individual structures become discrete. The largest cosmological structures are voids and walls, and to discuss both, we need to talk about mean cosmic density. Mean cosmic density is just a fancy way of describing how much generalized matter exists in an arbitrarily defined volume. Voids, then, are areas which have a lower mean cosmic density than the rest of the universe. When I discuss voids, I'm not talking about the relatively puny distances between planets like Earth and Mars. I'm talking about huge swaths of reality, where there is simply less matter than the rest of the universe. Voids really are enormous. This cannot be understated. The amount of matter in a void is measured by the number of entire galaxies that are in the void. Voids themselves can be over 325 million light years across, like way over. Like I said, there can be matter in a void. In fact, our entire galaxy exists inside the supermassive KBC void, which is 2 billion light years across. This region of space simply satisfies the requirement of a void that the mean cosmic density is less here than in other areas of the universe. Walls, on the other hand, are regions of space with a mean cosmic density comparable to the rest of the universe. These are the regions where galaxies congregate and matter interacts with a much greater frequency. 
The group of walls includes clusters, which are much denser regions of space, and filaments, which are tendrils of galaxies, which extend from walls into voids for many light years. The next lower order of complexity is superclusters. Superclusters are collections of galaxies which are close to each other in space. These giant conglomerates of galaxies make up some of the largest collections of matter in the entire universe. Galaxies, the brick and mortar of these superclusters, are themselves massive seas of stars which hurtle through space due to their own inertia. Galaxies can consist of stars numbering in the billions, and with multiple galaxies in a supercluster, the size of these behemoths is staggering. Galaxies themselves are typically classified by the total size and arrangement of the matter within them. The galaxy we inhabit, the Milky Way, is arranged in massive spirals which orbit around a supermassive galactic center, where a black hole most likely resides. I know I said I wouldn't discuss black holes in this video, but what can I say? I had to slide at least one. Decreasing further in scope, planetary systems within galaxies consist of one or multiple co-orbiting stars, and any other non-interstellar matter which orbits the star, or stars. This is where cosmology starts to get somewhat applicable to the average person, because we live in a planetary system that constantly affects us. The galaxy we are in also affects us, as does the massive void we inhabit, but changes in our planetary system, or solar system as we have affectionately named it, are much more apparent to us. It's still way bigger than you might think, but it's a bit more fathomable. Additionally, objects in planetary systems are clearly not homogenous the way the rest of the universe tends to be, so it's easier to study the differences in these objects. Stars are giant balls of superheated plasma held together by their own weight. Formed as stellar gas clumps together until there's enough stuff that it begins to fuse and release energy, stars are truly massive objects. The star nearest to us, the Sun, is by itself 99% of the mass of the solar system. They are so large because their great gravitational attraction tends to suck in the rest of the matter in their vicinity. This great mass and density is why, in their cores, nuclear fusion occurs. This natural process in which elements are literally forced together until they combine is responsible for creating every element heavier than helium. It also generates a massive amount of energy that is radiated out in all directions from the star. In our solar system, this energy travels about 93 million miles and is the very same energy that powers life on Earth. Stars can vary wildly in size, from relatively tiny but incredibly dense 20-kilometer neutron stars to red giants over 800 times as large as our Sun. Another step down, planets are defined as astronomical objects orbiting around a star which satisfy three conditions. First, it must be massive enough to reach hydrostatic equilibrium, which is a fancy way of saying that it's round. Second, it must be massive enough to absorb any smaller objects within its orbit, a process known as clearing the orbit. Third, it must be small enough to prevent nuclear fusion from occurring at its core, otherwise it becomes a star. Planets can be classified by their total mass, the characteristics of their orbit, and their material composition, among other things. In fact, you live on the most famous planet known to humanity, Earth. Planets may have one or more moons orbiting them as well. These are natural satellites which move around their parent bodies in stable orbits. By definition, these must be smaller than the planet they orbit. If that were not the case, the roles would simply reverse, and the moon would be the planet, and the planet would be the moon. To size them. Comets and asteroids also make appearances in planetary systems from time to time. Comets are icy spheres which have very large, long, eccentric orbits around stars. This takes them from the interstellar void, where the effective temperature is very low due to all the nothingness, right past a star, which radiates heat and energy. Comets typically evaporate a bit of their mass each time they pass a star, eventually disappearing altogether. 
Asteroids are a more nebulous group of space debris, which describes most indeterminate space rocks between 600 kilometers and go all the way down to microscopic sizes. Now that we've gone all the way from the entire universe to microscopic sizes, we can start to talk about the stuff that makes up everything in our universe. This is where we transition from astronomy to atomic theory, which is a great jump in relative size. You might notice that I'm ignoring all of biology, which is a subject which could be argued to come between astronomy and atomic theory in the grand scale of universal complexity. However, seeing as how life appears to be a phenomenon localized to Earth, at least for now, I have decided to avoid discussing biology for the same reason that I'm avoiding black holes and the like. It's too specific, and I'm more interested in the general idea of what is real, as per the cosmological principle. Anyways, if I were to discuss all of biology, it would just take far too long. Just know that you're alive and you're made out of the same stuff as everything else. Molecules are the next degree of complexity down. Molecules are structures formed from atoms bonding together and adhering to one another in fixed patterns. There are a vast number of possible molecules, in fact. There are as many as there are possible arrangements of all the atoms in the periodic table, sticking to rules set by chemistry, of course. The properties of a molecule are determined by the arrangement of its constituent atoms. The study of different molecules has a diverse range of applications, from biology to chemistry and material sciences. The attribute of molecules most relevant to this video, however, is that they are the link between highly complex macrostructures, things you think of when you think of things, and atoms. A more thorough investigation into the very interesting properties of molecules can be found in any high school chemistry textbook. Beneath molecules and complexity, as alluded to a moment ago, are atoms. Atoms are the smallest individual units of an element. Under typical conditions, atoms are very stable arrangements of matter which cannot be divided into two discrete units. For a very long time, in fact, scientists had assumed that this was the bottom rung of universal complexity, because atoms are so small, with a diameter ranging from 0.1 to 0.5 nanometers. Remember that everything else we have discussed has been many magnitudes of order larger than these distances. We've gone from billions of meters to billions of meters and we're getting closer to the smallest things in the universe. But we're not there yet. Atoms themselves are comprised of several subatomic particles, namely electrons, protons, and neutrons. Electrons have an extremely low mass and a negative electric charge. They're typically conceptualized as existing in a field around the nucleus of an atom which they orbit. The nucleus, which lies at the center of the space occupied by the atom, is a cluster of protons and neutrons. Protons have low mass and positive charge, while neutrons have a similar mass to protons and no electric charge. The positive charge of protons electromagnetically binds electrons to stable orbits around the nucleus. While the force of electromagnetism binds electrons to protons, the strong nuclear force binds protons to neutrons in the nucleus, creating the entire self-contained atomic structure. It's worth noting, by the way, that these subatomic particles are another leap in size smaller than atoms themselves. The nucleus of an atom, for example, can be compared to its orbiting electrons as a baseball in the middle of a stadium. It doesn't really work this way at these sizes, but for what it's worth, most of what we see and interact with is actually empty space. Beyond these subatomic particles lie what are known as the fundamental particles, or fermions. These are the smallest discrete particles definitively known to exist. Fermions are named after famed physicist Enrico Fermi and can be further subdivided into two categories, leptons and quarks. Leptons consist of electrons, muons, electron neutrinos, muon neutrinos, and tau neutrinos. Leptons are particles with a given electric charge, angular momentum, or spin, and mass. Quarks, on the other hand, are particles which create protons and neutrons. These don't typically exist on their own. We've only discovered their existence by high-energy physics experiments, which smash other particles together to see what breaks off. 
Quarks have mass and a fractional electric charge as well as spin. Quarks come in six types as well, or flavors. Up slash down, charm slash strange, and top slash bottom. Connecting all this to our understanding of the very smallest things, quantum theory, all leptons are manifestations of quantum fluctuations in space-time. As a consequence of this, two leptons cannot share the same quantum state, meaning the positions of two different leptons cannot be identical. This is the fundamental basis for matter being unable to phase through other matter. Is there anything smaller than these fundamental particles? Physicists and mathematicians have hypothesized smaller structures. This is the purview of string theory. String theory is an umbrella term which denotes all string theories, which in a very, very general sense involves structures known as strings, which are comparable to the Planck length, the theoretical smallest possible length anything can be. Quantum vibrations in these strings are said to create the fundamental particles we talked about above. However, this is all theoretical and simply a model which can be used to explore the interactions and genesis of fundamental particles. This stuff is so, so incredibly small that we currently don't stand a chance of trying to observe any of it. Additionally, limitations with how things even work at these sizes may prevent us from observing them on principle. The universe is strange at these extreme scales. So, once again, why does any of this matter? Why should we care about how reality is structured? Well, understanding the universe is important for humans. Reality is a very strange thing to experience. Throughout time, humans have asked questions about the nature of their own existence and sought to understand what the universe was. It's only natural for an ignorant, sentient component of a natural system to question its surroundings. That's a consequence of one of the key attributes of life reacting to environmental stimuli. This urge to understand the natural world manifests itself in many lines of questioning, evidenced by the various religious, philosophical, and scientific traditions and societies all over the world. Discovering and interpreting the physical laws of nature has become the purview of science due to the adaptability of the scientific method to answering questions about reality. Accordingly, Understanding the fundamental interactions between the constituent pieces of matter is the ultimate physical law to uncover. As we improve our understandings of these things, our models even allow us to make predictions about things we can't see. After all, the missing matter we talked about at the beginning of this video wasn't actually missing. We had predicted its existence well in advance. What will happen if we do uncover the answers we seek in the subatomic interactions of the universe? If we understand how matter interacts with itself at the most fundamental level, that information can be used to answer questions about phenomena of a higher complexity. Understanding the pure math and fundamental particle physics and fully exploring the implications it has regarding the behavior of matter is like glimpsing the base code of the universe. Insights gathered by seeing how reality functions at the lowest level could yield tools with which to attack higher order problems in fields such as chemistry, biology, and material sciences. I think it's possible that further breakthroughs in understanding how reality works could very well be the catalyst for the next human renaissance after all. So what do you think? Should we keep bothering to pursue these questions about our nature and the universe? Will we ever be able to answer these questions? Or is it all so complex, so vast that even trying is futile? As usual, let me know your thoughts in the comments below. All right, we did our best. Be gentle. <laughs> Just kidding. But um, this was our first video on some really, really sciencey stuff. And well, to be honest, we just bit off a lot. We went for this because we think it's really cool, understanding the nature of reality, and that's what this stuff is. I, at least personally, think there's something very powerful about having some vague, even a vague understanding of just, again, what reality is, what you're a part of. Because when you understand that, you can look at things and understand that they're a part of 
the bigger universe that we talk about when you look up at the stars you're not just looking up at the stars but you can hopefully at least begin to visualize sort of vaguely the scale of those things that those are gigantic fusion reactors that are in the process of making all of the elements that make up everything um, or even looking at things in day-to-day -day life and just understanding that these things are made of molecules these molecules are made of atoms and <laughs> eventually you get down to uh, quantum fields and string theory but grasping just the gist of the continuous structure of reality is a powerful thing i think all that being said we tackled a ton a ton of information in this video and uh I mean, we love this stuff, but neither Julius nor myself are cosmologists. There was a lot of research and stuff that went into this. And when you're not an expert on something, it's possible to get stuff wrong, even with the best research. So if you, dear listener slash viewer, are an expert and see something that we got wrong that I didn't see already. Sorry for all those uh, typo corrections in the video. Sometimes we catch this stuff after we film it and working on get one out every week. But if you notice anything that we didn't, please let us know in the comments below. We are always trying to improve. Otherwise, I hope that you enjoyed this, and I hope that this gets you thinking about reality, because you're a part of it. It's cool stuff. Anyway, as always, thank you for watching. Give this video a thumbs up if you liked it. If you didn't, you know what to do. We'll be back next week with more Long Story Short.